In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. Today I'm talking with John Thackera, Senior Fellow of the Royal College of Art, um, Founder and Director of the Doors of Perception Sustainable Design Conferences, author of many books including How to Thrive in the Next Economy. Hello John. Good morning. Um, I'm doing a series of interviews with people for an upcoming book on building a new economy around a mutual credit core and I wanted to talk to you about why we need to think about change at all. What's, what's the big problem? Well, it's an interesting uh, question, uh, Dave, that I spent many years uh, rehearsing my answer to that question and, and when all sorts of, it's not one big problem, there's lots of big problems. And I suspect that most of the people here today probably know most of those. Um, but it was, in my case, I'm a sustainability person. And I, I, my question about all the stuff that's happening in the world boiled down to why do we willingly trash the planet, which is our only hope? Why do we do it? What is going on? And so all the crises and the, you know, the kerfuffles and the things happening in the world from COVID through to unemployment through to, you know, wars. Uh, yeah, they all seem to be symptoms of something underlying it. And that's the kind of journey that I've been on is to say, well, what is driving all these strange behaviors? And when you say trashing the planet, um, what do you mean by that exactly? And, and where are good sources of information on exactly what's happening? So I met a man in 1993, and I wanted to make this point that I'm not a lifetime environmentalist. I'm a right sort of mid-career environmentalist. I met a man called Leo Janssen in 1993, who was a member of the Club of Rome, a very eminent, but very dry scientist, who told me in Amsterdam that, well, you do know that uh, we're living at five or 10 times beyond our means. I said, well, what do you mean beyond our means? He said, well, the planet can support a throughput of energy and materials and resource use of so much and we're using at least five or ten times more than the planet can bear and it's going to end up in badly he put it um, unless we radically reduce our imprint on the planet and that was the start of me saying ah okay so a scientist is convinced that something has gone horribly wrong uh, what are the consequences of that and um yeah okay so when you say throughput what, what is this throughput and what damage does it do? So uh, I think it's a fair question because I didn't know, and I'm not sure if I still know, it's one of these numbers games where he says, well, they, they wrote a book called Factor Four, which was um, the Club of Rome's official statement about how much uh, more energy and raw materials the world was using than could be sustainably um, carried on with. We couldn't go on like that, particularly when we seem to have an economy that had to grow all the time. Uh, and mm -hmm. so the damage came out in lots of different ways. But I do think it's a fair point when people say, well, I don't see it. Look, if I look out the window of my office or my car, I don't see this damage. Yeah. Uh, the damage was, and it's been true for me for 25 years, that the doom and the bad news is very abstract. And the thing that um, really kind of came home to me is that in terms of our, my personal relationships with where I live and the people I meet on a day-to-day -day basis, we are not suffering in, our, you know, in the rich countries from dispossession or ruin, but there's something bad going on. And that was the thing. I'm always looking for the story behind that. And eventually, I, just, I stopped being obsessed by scientists. And I learned to talk to you know, artists and um, historians and philosophers who said, well, the main problem is that we become disconnected from what nature is. We don't think about it, and therefore, if we're told that we're damaging it, we think, well, that sounds bad, but we're not experiencing it physically. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of gap between what all the experts say is happening and what we feel in our day-to-day -day basis, which I think is part of the psychological stress of being told that things are terrible, but we don't experience them as being physically terrible at that moment. Yeah. And so that is what somebody called the metabolic rift. You know, in our, in our, you know, in our 
behavior, but also in our you know, cognition, how we experience the world. Um, there's this gap between what nature is supposed to be in a terrible condition, but um, our day-to-day -day lives on the media, talking to each other through Zoom, yeah, we don't experience it. Yeah. So there's that yeah. gap. And although climate change is, is, uh, is in the mainstream now, I still find that a lot of people don't really take it seriously. They just think, well, it's, it's going to be slightly warmer, great. You know, you, you're not going to, it's a bad idea to live close to the sea. Okay, I won't live close to the sea. <laughs> Um, what else is going to go wrong? <laughs> it's like, but um, I, I agree. I don't think climate change. I'm not. I'm not exercised by climate change. There's a whole world of people for whom it's the kind of the most important thing in their lives, and they're very good and very often very intelligent people. But climate change is not something I personally experience in my day to day life. Yeah. So I don't actually expect people to take it seriously. Why should people get upset or let alone change anything? because of something they can't experience or see yeah. in their daily lives. So I don't blame people who are not turned on by the climate change thing. The other oh, yeah. problem being that climate change is just a constant flow of terrible news. And I think that even if you believe it's possibly true, it's so kind of global and all encompassing, it leaves you powerless to act. So that's the other reason I don't, I'm not a climate change campaigner, luckily for everybody. And I, I tend to focus more on biodiversity loss, but again, that's, you know, just bad news after bad news. But I, the, the report that um, really uh, exercised me was the, the, I think it was a German report about the, the loss of insects. The sort of, in some places in Europe, we've lost 80% of flying insects. And, and you, I remember, you know, in the 20th century, driving along on a summer's evening, you had to stop every half an hour to wipe all the bugs off your windscreen. That just doesn't happen anymore. And, my, and people might think, well, so what? There's fewer creepy crawlies. That's a good thing. It's like, that's the base of the food chain. That's, 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 that's what everything else depends on. And it's the, the decomposers and the pollinators and the soil manufacturers. And if, if we can't live with insects, we, we're in serious, serious trouble because nature's going to... I, I just so much agree with you. I've seen totally in my whole life, I remember when my dad drove me down the Doncaster bypass when I was a kid. It was the first time that a car would go one mile a minute. And he said, this is fine, but there's far too many insects and they mess up the windscreen. And so he was an engineer. He didn't really, uh, he thought biodiversity was a problem of messing up his car. But then nowadays you don't have that problem. And I think lots of people have these small, I mean, bird song in daily life is one of them. Uh, the lack of uh, certain flowers that we used to see when we were younger. That it's little things on a daily basis and very maybe very intimate that people notice but think they're too small to be significant. Yeah. I think that's the tragedy of the story so far, but I think it's changing, is that climate is too big to do anything about, and the things that we care about seem to be too small to complain about. So, yeah, yeah we, we keep quiet and just suffer. So how do, how do we talk about ecological problems to a wide audience in a, in a way that they'll listen to? So I uh, spent 20 years wagging my finger like many campaigners about the, the terribleness of the way we run the world. And I realized that people just switch off and I you know, realized that I don't blame them because I switch off if somebody wags their finger at me. Mm -hmm. And so I concentrate on the search for examples of things that are going better or you know, positive activity where somebody has restored um, a, a hedgerow or somebody has planted some plants for pollinators in their back garden or on their, you know, on the windowsill of their apartment. Um, people growing food on a small scale, but getting a tremendous amount of pleasure about it. So small local social activities that one can share. Uh, and once you start to look for it, it's just amazing how much of that's going on. But that is like so small and below the radar yeah. that it doesn't really register in the the media, which is all filled with the big and the bad and the abstract. Yeah, I mean, lowimpact.org is all about helping people to change the way they live. Um, but I know that that's not enough. Um, not when we live in a system that encourages people to consume more and more and to consume from the corporate sector, which sucks wealth out of communities and concentrates it. And that's exactly what most people do. The, the lifestyle message doesn't reach most people. Um, but your, your book was called How to Thrive in the Next Economy, uh, which is obviously much more than lifestyle change. So what is this next economy and, and how do we get there? Well, uh, 
If, if you're thinking it, then I would agree it's a slightly kind of sleazy title because it sounds like yet another one of these snake oil salesmen from a business school. But my publisher insisted on having giving it that title. I want to call it how to be a slime mold, which because I think the next economy is about millions of small actions that when you add them all up together, they begin to become the next economy. I, not I, 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 I thought for a second then, I thought for a second then you said you wanted to call your book how to be a slime mold, but that can't possibly be right, can it? No, it's completely true. And if you, there's a woman called Audrey, Audrey as a French scientist who I heard her lecture and there's a whole world of people out there who are mesmerized by the capacity of a slime mold to behave kind of rather effectively in getting food and uh, occupying its niche in the world. And when things get tough, they, it moves from somewhere to somewhere else. And slime molds are very, just one example of nature being incredibly cool, actually, without us necessarily noticing it. But my publisher said, well, you and your three hippie friends might know what that title <laughs> means. But, uh, we're going to call it something more with a broader appeal. So that's what we, we came to. And then I found this guy called Ilya Prigozhin, who's a sort of a physicist, who, who said basically that big systems change as a result of the accumulation of lots of small changes. Right. And that you don't necessarily know how that happens. But this that was the moment combined with talking to scientists and botanists and ecologists that I realized that small changes have meaning and significance. Yeah, but I mean, we do... I mean, change needs to be systemic, doesn't it? We need we need system change rather than. I mean, I I hear what you say. Lots of small changes can result in big changes, but um, you know, I live in London, and the vast majority of people in London, are, they you know, they're pretty unreachable. They it's it's about consuming a lot and earning a lot of money. And um, I I know I live a lot of my life in London, although I've been away from it for many years now. I mean, you know, my, my daughter lives in London. I have lots of friends, obviously, in London. And I think that if I went around and told them to, to consume less, they'd all think I was a sad boy. Yeah, I think you're insane. If I said, would, you, would you like to have better food on a daily basis? They say, yes, and by the way, where do we get it from? Or would you like your child to spend a day a week or a day a month in a forest, you know, falling off a, off a log? Yes, that would be great. Or would you like to have chickens in your back garden? You look at all the little features of a healthier life, and pretty much in favour. And then what you and I can't, you know, I can't speak for London and Londoners, but there's an awful lot of fantastic things happening in London that have a kind of that are bits of what an alternative world would be like. You know, London National Park City. I'm a big fan of that. Have you come across that initiative? Say it again. It's basically. London National Park City. So somebody said, well, actually, London is filled with little green spots and back lanes and abandoned little bits of uh, buildings that are filled with weeds and, um, you know, life, but we neglect it because they just thought to be not interesting. And so the National Park City is basically a map of everybody's favorite nook and cranny in London, all put together um, in a website or an app of some kind, and you can then in your vicinity, go and find somebody growing a courgette on their balcony or a, a little park that's been neglected or a bit of disused railway track, which has incredible biodiversity in it. There's so much of that happening, but it's scattered. And in, if we share an interest in biodiversity, it's now kind of established that there's more uh, diversity of microbial life in cities than there is in most of the nature of the world. The cities are messy kind of, you know, things filled with nutrition, which we call waste and trash and sewage and so on. And there's a fantastic amount of diversity there that is for the most part invisible, but it's there. And it's in terms of, if you talk to public health people, there's this big debate about what is a healthy city after COVID, obviously. Mm. And they're really scared that cities will think that if they kind of concrete more of themselves over and cut down all the weeds and get rid of all the kind of smelly bits that they will become healthier. But actually the, uh, you know, the microbiologists and the epidemiologists think that that'll make things worse. That actually cities can be much more healthy and thriving with different forms of life in them. Um, and exactly if we don't, not in a top down way, but giving everybody the encouragement to go and cultivate a square yard somewhere. So your, your attitude is focus on the positive. Um, I guess, the problem is, I mean, the biodiversity loss is not slowing down, is it? It's, it's, um, and I'm just, 
afraid that you know most people won't hear this message and they won't really um, change their life very much. I agree that I, I agree that people don't hear messages. So I think that I well, I'm not pretending that I've succeeded, but my mission in life is not to be a message emitter. Right. But I know I know it's my profession, but to create conditions and events and moments in which people can experience things for themselves. Right. So for example, I do quite a lot of work in Italy with farming communities and people in small villages which have been abandoned and they're kind of you, know, you often see them in the magazines about you know the ruin of Italy and these places that nobody lives in anymore. We don't go and give people lectures about you just all live moved to the countryside. We just go and find examples of people with small farms or small restaurants or small um, uh, you know uh, ceramic company or small olive mills and demonstrate that there's an incredible um, amount of pleasure and joy and uh, yeah, success to be had in running small rural enterprises. And not that you have to leave the city and become a peasant, but that you can be a part-time member of that. And so in Italy, it's you know, remarkable how many people have, you know, a friend who has an olive grove or a friend with, with, a, with a, a rural college of some kind. And there's a lot of coming and going from the city. So you have a part-time country life based on working, not just based on going on holiday. So I think we can do a lot like that. And I think it happens in London as well. Uh, I don't know, homemade bread or homemade pesto or homemade food uh, that you can, where you know the person who grew it and the person and you know people who make it and you have some kind of relationship with the people who are involved with your food. It's just a much more, you know, fulfilling and nice way to live. And that's yeah. not just middle class, rich people or for, um, you know, passionate environmentalists. It's pretty widespread now, yeah. particularly when you get into the other cultures that cities like London have, people from all over the world, have incredible passion and skill on things like bread or potatoes that we can all share with. And that's, to me, when I want to have the most joyful time is to go to some kind of food event where people share recipes and share knowledge from different cultures about how to make food. Very simple. And that's going on all the time, if you just look around. I, um, I read your article about... Uh... Ikea wanting to become the, you know, the greenest company in the world and yet uh, wanting to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, I guess that's the thing about the, this economy. It has to perpetually grow, doesn't it? I mean, do, can lifestyle, can individual people doing wonderful things make any difference in an economy that has to grow forever? I totally think that personal changes are valuable if they make you feel less uh, pressured and stressed, but they won't change the system. No, you're right about that. I personally believe that the system is kind of got smoke coming out of the hood and is heading towards the ground anyway. If you, I mean, the world is in such a kind of dire state, economically as well as with things like COVID, that um, it's not about us changing the system. It's just how, how can we create the elements of the next uh, situation as right now? So if you read historians, which I don't do very much, but historians normally tell you that, you know, systems and civilizations and societies, when they change, it doesn't happen like day and night. One day, if somebody changes, you have long periods of chaos and discomfort and disorder, but out of which comes something else. And I kind of rather strongly feel that's where we are at the moment. Yeah. So I try to teach myself not to scream at the internet about politicians and you know, people trying to whip you up into a frenzy about kind of culture issues. I think it's so much more fulfilling to go and talk to somebody with a farm or a bakery or a school um, and find out from them, you know, what, how's it going and what can you, what do you need to do it differently? And then sometimes I can introduce them to somebody who can maybe help them out. Yeah, there's a number of people I interview and their, their basic attitude is, well, this system is going to crash. It, it may not be next week, but we're we're on a we're on a crash trajectory. Um, whether it's sort of ecological degradation or just out of control finance system and debt or nuclear war or um, we're we're all of the above. I'm I mean, a big fan of the World Economic Forum. Has this uh, every year they bring out a thing called the World Economic Forum Risk Report. And I've got, I'm not going to show you, but I've got it on the, the wall and elsewhere in my office, um, a picture of the report from 2016. 
And it's like 50, you know, pandemics, financial crisis, migration, war, and basically 70% of the things that they described in 2016 as a risk are happening right now. Yeah, yeah. So I think that we are in the middle of the system crashing. It's not as if it's some future event. Yeah. You know, yeah. the good news is that, you know, if we survive a day, then it's one day towards the next system. And yeah. um, that's how I kind of, I don't want to sound trite because there's lots of people having a much worse time on a daily basis than me, obviously. But I do not, I don't think it's about some future event. I think it's happening now. Yeah, I guess that, I guess that our task, is, the task is to get things in place, which will sort of um, catch people if everything does fall over. Um, and, you know, provide... well, don't you think that it's happening? I, that's why your work is so inspiring to me, is that you demonstrate examples of people providing mutual credit or mutual support in lots of ways right now. For the most part, very small scale, but it's like you know, it's like having a, a boat sitting bobbing into it. There's an approaching storm, and there's a small boat with people sort of messing about in it. But the boat is available for us to get in and go somewhere else. Yeah. And so, the the tools and the platforms that you teach us about, um, it's I think we just have to be ready to to learn, frankly. And I would be surprised when your book comes out if it doesn't have a big big readership because people will have decided now is the time oh we've got to learn about this stuff before it was you know weirdos with their you know theories about money or like people like me with strange ideas but our ideas are no longer strange when the situation becomes dire and i think now people are ready to to learn and to practice and to to take up take these suggestions forward